Britain, the home of the British. 65 million of us, bound together by the love of a nice grab bag of crisps, a brisk walk in the fresh air, and pretending we're busy so we don't have to see our friends. Our history and culture are the envy of the rest of the world. But our weird behaviour and complicated social codes leave other nations utterly baffled. Yes, prince or pauper, publican or politician, we all spend every waking moment flustered, flummoxed and frustrated by very British problems. If you've ever been too polite to recline your seat in an aeroplane, shown how much you liked someone by insulting them, or lost sleep over who you'll be sat next to at a wedding, then don't panic. These are very British problems, and you are not alone. It's ridiculous, but we do it. We do it because we're British. In this series, we'll take a look at the hidden codes that citizens of this island are somehow hardwired to follow. We fear looking arrogant. I'm just terrified I'm going to see the wrong thing. Please, don't make a scene. It's fine. And we'll investigate the logic behind our bizarre British behaviour. You weird little sprites, you. Yes, OK, we've got problems, but they're our problems. Very British problems. British and I fucking love tradition. In this episode, we'll take a look at where it all went wrong for us. Our school days. We'll focus our microscope onto those crucial years that turn us from friendly five-year-olds to awkward 18-year-olds, the very birthplace of our very British problems. Now, the earliest lesson us Brits take home from school and never quite shake off is the vital importance of not drawing attention to yourself. So next time you're stood staring awkwardly at your feet, you can trace it right back to the playground, because school is all about running with the crowd. School isn't about lessons in Britain. School is about dealing with the playground. It's about walking in and being able to join in with six or seven of the pretty girls. The worst thing that my mum ever did to me throughout the whole time I went to school is the very first day I started, she got me the, um, the, the official school bag. <laughs> big no-no. Absolute big no-no. No, if no. you are in the, in the uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. years above and you've got a group of New Year 7s coming in and you want to know which ones to pick on, yeah, the ones with bag. the official school bag. Yeah. I had it one day and I got called geek and everything. <laughs> Don't listen to them, I'm sure you look very smart. In Germany, kids on their first day at school get a cone full of sweets. Here, you're more likely to get a dead arm. What I do think is problematic is going to the local comprehensive when you've got a private school accent. Because I turned up there, hello, <laughs> hoping to make some new friends here at Hazelwick. And then I got spat at. You know, I wish somebody had sat down to me going, look, man, I'm going to be honest with you, you are so punchable right now, it's unbelievable. Are you taking a briefcase in? <laughs> are you mental, mate? Even being a vegetarian, you know, my mum made me hummus and avocado sandwiches. And the girls were like, why can't you have ham and cheese? You know, like, I failed on the sandwich criteria. In September, 650,000 budding Brits begin their school careers. They arrive with one name, but they often leave with another. A friend of mine who had a nickname at school, he's now in his 30s and people still know him by this nickname. And it is a nickname that he picked up on the first day of school when he was 13 years old. He's got a wife, he's got kids, he's got a job, but he is still known by everyone as Skids because when he got to school, they found out that his older brother who had left the school three years ago, someone had found skid marks in his older brother's pants. So the minute he arrived, he was already... He was already skids. His life had already been laid out in front of him. Brutal. 
This British tradition of giving nicknames goes back to before 1066, when ordinary folk didn't have surnames. Without nicknames, it would have been hard to tell people apart. 13th century records mention men known as bad in the head, rotten herring, and always drunk. I realised recently how not many of my friends call me by my real name. I've had a lot of things like, why, why, why does that person call you Minky? I don't know, to be honest. I think it's very British to give nicknames, not, normally not very nice ones. Fat German was one of mine. Sort of fat, like German. Friends call me the cow man eater. They used to call me Jaff Cake Nips. Jaff Nips. Cos, you know, when you go through puberty, you get big nips. I was terrible at sports, to the point where I got nicknamed Bentfoot. <laughs> My brother had a spotted back, he was dartball back. Horrible, wasn't it? And Joe was dog shit breath, cos once he had bad breath. That stuff follows you about. Dog shit especially. Kids, if they're being horrid, you just go and tell your teacher. Unless your teacher's going to give you a nickname too, of course. I was, like, huge as a kid, like, really fat. I did judo classes at school. Um, there was only one other kid that was big enough to support me. It's this big, fat, white guy, and whenever we were sparring, they said, right, coffee and cream to the mat. It's racially unacceptable, but at the time, we all didn't think anything of it. It's, like, it's really funny, we've got a nickname, coffee and cream. It's weird, actually, because whenever anyone else was fighting, everyone fought, and then we were the last bout, and it would just be us. I'm starting to think, now I talk about it, it was just a spectacle thing, like, oh, guys, sit round, coffee and cream are going to fight. Look at these two fat pricks. There's one consolation, though. If you started off anonymous amongst a sea of other Daves, you're going to be more memorable as the only Nobby. In fact, earning a nickname is often schoolboy code for we like you and probably means you've acquired yourself a few mates. I think nicknames are affectionate for British people because it's like, oh, you know, only mock you because I like you. But there's nothing nice about being called Jaffa Kate Nips, is there? I think I'd rather not be liked than people shout Jaff Nips at me. Wouldn't you? to learn, so you might think you'd be rewarded and respected for doing well at it. Nope, not in Britain. It's quite an interesting point where you decide, as a youngster, do you want to be cool or do you want to be clever? Now, I always thought it was cool to be clever. It's not, as it turns out. When you're a teenager, you're kind of expected to be quite cool about school. You're kind of expected to be a bit disdainful and a bit rebellious and not want to obey the rules. And I never got that memo. So I was that really annoying girl in the class who was always sort of going, me, me, I know, I know. Actually, I've read this, and actually, I read something else about that, which you didn't even ask us to read, but I just sort of read it. UK school, you learn how not to look like you're actually trying. You, if you're... If you're like this all day long, you'll be murdered at lunchtime by the rest. You'll be dragged down to the bottom of the playground and... and murdered. Showing up your peers, who might happen to be a bit less academic, is a surefire means to make yourself unpopular. In fact, as we grow up, we find the way to win hearts may be to do completely the opposite. Compared to a lot of other cultures, we don't sort of celebrate Cleverness is almost seen to be a suspicious thing. I mean, I remember Princess Di used to joke the whole time about how she's, I haven't got any O-levels. It was sort of, she was really, you know, it was like she was quite proud of it. So, you can pretend to be dumb to become popular. Well, some of you won't have to pretend, but how else can you win friends and influence people in a British school? Easy. Impress everyone with your sporting prowess. In my school, the things that you were celebrated for were rugby and cricket. Didn't learn fuck all at all, other than playing football. I was like, when I get into the top year, I'm going to get into the football team. And then the bloody American guy turned up and he was really good at soccer. So he got into the team and I didn't. But it's fine, I'm over it. It hurts me every day. Although being good at sports is a definite advantage, 30% of British school children don't enjoy physical education at all. Maybe because it can sometimes be physically dangerous. 
goalposts used to have for the nets used to have these little hooks all the way up the, the, the post. Um, and I climbed onto the crossbar. And then when I got down, I slid down the, the post, which of course is just sliding all the way through the hooks. And I split the scrotum part, and my testicle fell onto the turf. <laughs> and people thought it was a rugby ball and ran <laughs> off with it and scored a try. The golfer came along, <laughs> Mr Magoo came along and smacked him with a golf club. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. Poor Bob. Hope it didn't affect him in later life. Still, it's not half as bad as forgetting your kit. I can remember very definitely thinking if I haven't got my kit, I don't have to do PE, and then going to get a kit out of the lost property. And that is horrific. I mean, that's just the worst. You have someone's shorts that hasn't been washed, or a rugby top that hasn't been washed, and it's smelly, or it's wet, or it's damp, and then you're like, these tight shorts that can't go up your legs, and then, ah. Oh. It's just awful. You, you know, you wear it, particularly if you're my size, because you're not going to find anything that fits. So I can remember playing rounders in like a three-quarter length cut-off vest and some shirts that I hope were stained with mud, but I'm still not sure. You don't forget your kit again after that, it works. Up there goes the bell for break. Hope you've enjoyed your first day at school and have been suitably scarred for life. So, we've got through our first few years at school and dipped our toes in the chlorinated pool of anxiety and awkwardness. Next lesson on the timetable, adolescence. Us Brits are one of the least confident nations in Europe. 13% of us suffer from gelatophobia, the fear of people laughing at us, compared with just 2% of the super confident games. And it all starts with the first day of games. PE changing rooms were excruciating, really embarrassing. If I go to hell, it will look like the changing room at my school. Yes, it's changing rooms before and after PE when everything starts to get a bit hairy. Growing up was really awkward, like when you hit puberty, and it's like, Everybody was having a puberty around me, apart from me. And I was like, oh my gosh. Like, people would say stuff, and I was thinking, like, my friend Justin was like, have you, um, have you got, have you got hair? And he's like, of course. And I was like, yeah, 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 I've got, yeah, I've got that too. I was just, just checking that you've, you've got it, because I've got it. Pubes were huge. Who's got pubes? Who's getting pubes? Who hasn't got pubes? He's got pubes. Why haven't I got pubes? Like, I remember a real joke. Oh, you know, apparently James Corden found a pube last night and then he pissed out of it. <laughs> the showers at school were a daily update on how everyone was getting on with puberty. Oh, see, Simon. Simon looks like a gorilla. Whereas uh, Norris is still in nappies. It's not just our hair that grows at different rates. The post-PE shower gives everyone the chance to find out where they stand in the pecking order. I'll never forget the scariest moment of school was getting ready to go in naked and the first couple had and then like somebody just going like oh my god sansa has got a small dick and it was just like oh my god I'm putting my shorts back on because I, <laughs> I can guarantee that I think I've got a small dick so I definitely think it's going to be smaller <laughs> than his and it was it was horrible it was just that the idea that god, oh. that, that could have been me like you'd have the girls with, like massive knockers at nine and you'd be like <laughs> And then you'd have, like, you know, the ones who didn't get any to, like, 16 and stuff, and you'd be like, oh. Yes, while the boys are struggling with their manhoods, we girls have got our very own very British problems. For gym, we wore knickers over our own knickers. And if you had your period, you got to wear your tennis skirt. So everyone knew... Did you have your period? 
I mean, it was awful. It was so embarrassing. One of my best friends at school, I think, we learnt a lot by letting her do it first. I think with tampon, she used the whole thing and had to go to the school nurse. She put everything in there, the wrapper, the, uh, the cardboard, everything. I was like, you're not supposed to do that. And so she had to have it removed. UK parents are dunces when it comes to talking to their kids about puberty. Whereas our Dutch neighbours are happy to talk testosterone over the dinner table, studies have shown the vast majority of British parents would rather never mention the subject at all. It's interesting that some cultures uh, celebrate the onset of puberty. There's a big party at 13. You know, there's a bar mitzvah, for example. It's like, hey, you're about to get pubes. Hooray! But we don't celebrate until you're 18. Then it's okay because that messy business of puberty is now over. Come on. Come on, dude. And it's around this time in our school careers that we Brits don't just notice the changes in our own bodies but in our classmates too. There was a girl at our school, if you took her a walnut whip, she'd let you feel her boobs. 100% true. There was a queue of about four of us once, just a walnut whip, and you'd go round the side of our house and you'd just put your hands on just for a walnut whip. I was up the railway lines, me and me mate, and we met these two girls. One was in the year above me. She said, look, if we go to this pillbox here at the side of the railway line, and I dropped my trousers, will you drop yours? And I said, yeah, well, you go first. So she dropped her trousers, and then we ran off. Mm. And she couldn't pull her trousers up quick enough to catch us, but I'll tell you what, if she had a caught us, she would have kicked shit out of us. She really? was massive. <laughs> it's fair to say that discussing personal matters doesn't come particularly easy to us Brits. Only 11% of our teenagers get their initial sex education from their parents with the vast majority picking it up from school. Here, maybe a diagram will help. Here's the people. So education in schools is like the pinnacle of awkwardness in British schools. If you had to show an alien race what awkward was, just show them sex education being taught by a British teacher in a British school, and you've got it all in one. Innuendo is a staple of British humour, and it's probably because we can't bring ourselves to use the correct biological terms. Even our very own Shakespeare used 45 different words for penis. When I was taught sex education, the mention of the word penis, I'm out of commission for about 20 minutes just laughing at that. So I, I'm not going to be in a position to take on any more information because you've said penis. I'm sorry. You're going to have to, like, extend the lesson or something. But even then, I've said extend, and that's making me laugh. I could not stop laughing <laughs> the whole time. When I became a teacher, they had to counter that. So what you do is you say penis, that gets a laugh, and then you go, what other words are there for penis to just get rid of that? So people are going cock, monster, pee-pee, dicky, wang. Fang, dong. Sex education is hard enough, but our science teacher and the person who gave us the that talk was called Mr. Silcock. Come on, give us a break. Winky dink, winky wank, plunger, big mushroom, purple-headed monster, baby's arm. Do you know what I mean? Like that, you have to do that. Get it all flushed out the system. Mm. We know that no one likes a clever clogs in the British classroom, but sex ed is the one subject where the more you know, the more kudos you get. A representative from a tampon firm came to my school to round up the girls and have a more frank discussion about sex. And I remember she waffled on about sperm for a bit and we all just stared at her, and then my friend put her hand up genuinely and said, so can I get pregnant if he comes in my mouth? And then the woman never said another word, just packed up all of her tampons and left. 
Now, if it's embarrassing for the children being taught, British sex education is absolutely mortifying for the teachers. So they keep the whole subject completely dry. And no pun intended. I mean, it's awkward. We all know those diagrams of the sliced-in-half penis, flaccid, with the tube coming through it and the testes. And then there's the, the girl, you know, reproductive organs, that, that diagram. A pair of tubes and two sex glands or ovaries. It didn't tell you anything. I mean, it showed you the internal bit of it. That's yeah, not what you want to... Yeah, it's use. I don't want to know how close it's getting to the cervix from a diagram on the TV, <laughs> doing a projector. Because that's... that's very rarely what you think about. <laughs> yeah. So, we're a little repressed when talking about sex. What's the big deal? No harm done. We started when I was about 14, 15, and there was a girl sitting next to me, pregnant. In our, first, in our first sex education class, she was there pregnant. Um, they was getting her to put a condom on a banana. I think that horse has bolted, mate. I think, I think we're wasting our time here. So, we're halfway through our education and those VBPs from school are really stacking up. We're embarrassed about our bodies. We can't talk about sex. And some of us have even got pregnant. We're taking a look at our weird ways and winding the clock back to the place where we picked them all up. School. British education is a mystery to other nations. I find the British school system really confusing because you've got, like, public schools, which aren't public schools, they're only public schools if you've got, like, 30 grand a year to go to them. And then there's private schools, which aren't really private schools. And then you've got academies and co-eds and, and all sorts of grammar schools. In Ireland, we have just one, and it's just, like, the nuns. And nothing's more different about our schools than how we dress. 90% of secondary schools wear good old traditional school uniform, compared with only one-fifth of American ones. How scruffy. In America, you've got the emos, and you've got the goths, and you've got the cool dudes, you've got the hipsters, you've got all these little microcosms of, 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 of fashion, you know, at the, at the age of 14 or 15. If you wear a uniform in a school in America, you're, you're in a, a, a military academy or reform school. We haven't got school uniforms in Canada, and I love them. It makes the children look more serious, you know, like they're ready to learn. They're in, like, little suits almost, little skirts and knee-highs. And in Canada, we rolled up in track suits at a school that cost nothing and taught us nothing. School uniforms first appeared in Britain in the 16th century, when the poorest pupils were dressed in cheap, long blue coats. 460 years later, they're still wearing the same uniform at Christ's Hospital School in West Sussex, though hopefully they're giving it a wash. Uniform matters to the British as it teaches our children to conform from their very first day at school. From a very early age, you are taught lessons that, whether you like it or not, stay with you for the rest of your life. We get them when they're young. That's what we do. We get them, we repress them when we're young, and then they're like that forever. School uniform is virtually unheard of in the rest of Europe, so our continental cousins start experimenting with their own clothes when very young. The only fashion dilemma for the British pupil is how to wear your tie. I had no fashion sense whatsoever. To me, clothes were just things that stop you being naked. And at no time is our lack of style more apparent than the one day a term when British kids are allowed to wear their casual clothes. Some schools call this Mufti Day, which is British Army slang for civilian gear. Mufti Day? Mufti Day? Did you not call it Mufti no, Day? No, I didn't. It's not Mufti Day, isn't it? No. It is? No. It's just non-uniform day. Mufti Day. Dress down day. No, dress down. Mufti. What's the Mufti bit about it? I don't know. Like, still to this day, the thought of a poncho makes me just feel so... It makes me feel hysterical, the, the idea I'm going to have to put it on and then walk into the middle of Bishop Goodwin Junior School and have all the girls laugh at it. I just can't, I can't. It's like, but these are formative experiences. You have to have this. Bat wing cardigan, because that's very slimming, isn't it? Polka dot bat wing cardigan and colotes. Colotes. I look like MC Hammer. A T-shirt and shorts 
with Jason Donovan and Kylie Minogue's faces on them and the words especially for you. But that was kind of like the death of my fashion innocence. Oh, never mind, Francesca. If there's one thing worse than rocking up in terrible clothes, it's forgetting it's non-uniform day altogether. You come yes. in with your uniform on. Oh. Oh, if you come in I with mean, your you uniform on, I'm in uniform. You're not getting away with no. it. No. Seeing a child walk on to the bus, he sees everyone's in their mufti, <laughs> his face drops, and you know he's about to have the eight worst hours of his life. <laughs> We can leave the sartorial decisions to our parents, but there's a good chance that'll have disastrous results. Came home and I said, Mum, uh, in two weeks' time, Harvest Festival, we're doing a parade through the town. I need to be a squirrel. Two weeks later, Sunday night, Mum, have you got my squirrel outfit costume tomorrow? My mum went white in her face and her eyes changed in a way that said, I have never given this a second thought. I went to school the next day in a brown jumper, a pair of my sister's leggings, and my mum got a pair of tights, put one leg inside the other, and filled it with socks, balls of socks, right? And safety pinned it to my ass. So it just flopped on the floor. Basically, I looked like a boy wearing my sister's leggings, having the biggest shit you've ever seen. Even the bullies at school didn't bully me for it because they looked at me and were like, his mum's done him in there. Whatever odd British tradition we're celebrating at school, our parents always have the power to amplify the embarrassment. I remember that it was tradition that if it was your birthday, you get egged on your way out of school. They were chasing me, like, eggs were flying all around me. And then I got to the car. My mum jumped out of the car, just started beating the shit out of those kids with her handbag. Like, oh, leave him alone! Leave him! Like, that is... Mum, do you think this will help or hinder me getting bullied in the future? Whether we like them or not, it's school where we develop our British addiction to traditions and rules. We'd have house line-up, so we'd have it like the army. So we'd have to stand to attention, and then we'd do a right turn, and then we had to march to our lunch. You're not allowed to lean back on your chair. I never quite understood that. Has anyone ever died from that? You never hear, Jane's husband passed away, or oh, what? What happened? Oh, he's, he's at work and he's just leaning leaning back on his chair and it, it tipped over, crushed his skull, as is so often the case when you fall backwards off a chair, and, uh, and he passed away, left to nothing. Tragic. It's really only at school that the fear of falling off a chair exists. Actually, Jack, almost 5,000 children a year visit hospital with chair-rocking injuries. But there's more to school than just the classroom. It's great fun being at school when this kind of thing happens. Every year, Maida Vale High School have a trip to Eastbourne and Beachy Head. Every year, seven million kids pick up seven million lunchboxes, jump on a coach and escape the school premises. I just remember school trips just getting so excited. Just the, just the sheer excitement. No one's ill on a school trip day. When you hear someone's, got, someone's not coming on a school trip day, then you're like, oh, they're definitely ill. The first recorded British school trip took place in 1898, when a geography teacher discovered that none of his pupils had ever seen a glacier before, so marched them off to Switzerland for a month. It's all right, any ice in the stream will get caught up in the shoe. And for some nations, the school trip still lives up to the hype, but not over here, naturally. We all got to go to Washington, D.C. on a bus for four days. It was great. We partied like crazy, and it was the best... It was the best holiday ever. Uh, my kid, on the other hand, went to the Isle of Wight. The island that fun forgot. Every year, the girls make a study of this section of the coast as part of their curriculum. We're going to go to the Jurassic Coast. And I'm like, oh, I've been watching Jurassic Park. We're going to hunt for dinosaurs. I'm like, oh, my God, this is the best. Basically, you're just, it's pissing down. It's ringing wet. It's been of November. I'm standing on what was apparently a beach, shoveling 
looking for dinosaur bones. Right, and I'm not a pessimist, I'm quite an optimistic person, but I think we've probably found them all there. I grew up in High Wycombe where we had a chair museum, which is, I'm sure you can imagine, has one very constant thing that runs throughout it, which is they're all chairs. Viking centres in the cold, uh, castles in the cold, everything had to have an educational value to it, and there would usually be a test afterwards to make sure we'd had all of the educational value out of the school trip. At the Horticultural Hall, Westminster, the schoolboy's own exhibition is open again. Just don a spacesuit and a goldfish bowl, and you can be off on a journey through time. So let's see what lessons we Brits really take away from our school trip. The greatest thing that ever happened when I was at school was when we went to a big adventure theme park and one of my friends got fingered in the haunted house. <laughs> <laughs> it was amazing. <laughs> we talked about it for about 16 weeks. our first trip and our first fumble and it's time for another first getting drunk we brits are the biggest binge drinkers in europe and it all starts in our school days i just remember that you know the first time you have a drink you just feel like this like kind of wonderful and like magical being don't you and suddenly it's just like everything is possible i can speak to any boy i'm the greatest dancer look at me here i am it's grace dent hello and then you wake up the next morning and you're just like, you know, you've got carrot in your hair. French children often try watered-down wine at home with their parents from a young age. But in Britain, we don't see alcohol as a shared and relaxed family experience. For us, drinking is a badge of honour. It's part of the process of stopping being a kid and becoming your own person. So you start to make decisions that are separate from what your parents are advising you. You start to take matters into your own hands. And that often can end up with you vomiting for four hours. But it was your decision. If drinking is a way to lose one's social inhibitions, then it's no surprise we uptight Brits have to drink more than anyone else. Researchers found that over a quarter of British teens had been drunk the previous month, compared to 17% of young Europeans. <laughs> The first time I got properly drunk was uh, I was staying in my sister's flat and she'd gone away and, and she left bottles of home brew, but it was fearsome stuff. Um, and I, having never really been drunk before, I was more drunk than I have ever been since. I remember rolling around on the carpet sort of shouting, I don't know what, and I don't know at whom. Uh, and then I started being sick, and I continued to be sick for a very, very long time. I fell in love with it straight away. It was cider. I spewed up in my wardrobe. <laughs> I spewed it all up in my wardrobe, but I knew that was the future. Interestingly, that also led me on, because I didn't clean it up very well, and some mould grew in it. And then uh, for a few years, I used to grow mould in my bedroom. I used to get a, a little yoghurt pot or something. Just put whatever, put a bit of wee-wee in, any, anything you could think of, put it in, and grow big plumes of mould. <laughs> and that all came from the booze. <laughs> and drink it. No, I didn't even drink it. It looks really pretty. But none of us are any the worse for it, really. Apart from the 6,500 British teens who get admitted to hospital with alcohol poisoning every year. I was at my mate's house. His, his mother was out. He's having comfort. Dr Pepper. It seemed like a fucking brilliant idea. Had a pint of it and uh, had me stomach pumped. <laughs> Don't remember fuck all other than waking up in an hospital with me mother sobbing her heart out. I learnt me fucking lesson now, yeah. So let's just go through your grades. That's an A for alcohol abuse, but only an F for fashion sense.
We're nearing the end of our school career and we should be preparing ourselves for the real world struggles of adulthood. But we're British, so we can never talk about the things that really matter. Brits in school are institutionalized. They're taught how to think rationally. They're taught how to think laterally. They're crammed with facts and figures and theories. So you come away with an education in Britain and you know a lot of stuff, but you have no social skills whatsoever. None. Unlike our European neighbours, Britain still retains around 400 single-sex schools, so it's hardly surprising relations with the opposite sex are often fraught with tension. I went from an all-boys school to a mixed school when I changed school. I had to meet the headmaster at the new school, and he's having a chat with me. All I was thinking was, I can't believe there's going to be girls here. It's all I could think about. That's it. It's just a... It's, that's all that matters. Get girls, be around girls. How do I get girls? The world was a certain way. It was fine. It was mates and football, and that was it. And then suddenly, it's all gone, irrelevant. It's just girls. Also unlike the repressed Brits, with our system built on segregation of the sexes, the relaxed Americans consider it their duty to pack the timetable with events that will bring boys and girls together. In school in America, there's always something that you can ask someone specifically to do, whether it's the prom or a dance or a party, whereas here it's just kind of like, hey, hey, you want to... We get together sometime? And do what? Like, where are we going to go? Uh, I haven't thought about that. I just wanted to know if you just actually like me enough to want to spend some time with me. In the last decade, we Brits have slowly started to embrace the American prom. But the humble disco is still the basic British school get-together. And our social confidence still lags way behind the United States. There's always gender segregation at these things, where like all the girls were down one side of the, the hall and then all the boys were down the other side, and then you get one guy, it was never me, there's some guy who's like the alpha of the group that would make his way across the hall, and you just think, oh, my God, I wish I was you, man. I wish I was you, but I'm not. I'm me. And it's so depressing. I was shy, too shy to go up to someone. I didn't know what you did. Did you put a formal request in? Uh, did you just sort of lean over with your tongue wagging out the front of your mouth? Did you grab their boobs? I had no idea. No one sort of tells you what to do. So I would sort of um, always just skulk in the corner, really. So why do we emotionally stunted Brits put ourselves through this torture? Simple. We're all hoping for a good old Frenchie. was banned by King Henry VI in 1439 because he thought it was spreading the plague. Even without the prospect of disease, young Brits lack confidence in their snogging skills. I remember on Going Live, right, they, they, they used to have a bit on Going Live about, like, kids write in with, like, problems. And I remember, what, I remember they always used to have the same one, which was a kid going, I don't know how to kiss. And they'd always go, well, what you do... You know, to practice, get your hand like that and then kiss your hand. Okay. That isn't a technique. There's no way of practicing. No. First time I tongued the girl, there's a lot of, lot of teeth action, really, to be honest. There was, a, there was a, a, a little social club, a little club for like naughty kids. I tongued her up against the wall and just basically we just smashed our, our teeth into each other for about 10 minutes. My first dog was this girl at school and she wrote me a note. Meet me in the toilets. I was like, why, why? Why do we have to meet in the toilets? She was there, and then I was like, okay, what's up? What are you doing? She was like, kiss me. And I was like, oh. <laughs> she was like, no. Just, and she grabbed me. She's like, open your mouth. So I was like, close your eyes, open your mouth. It was like, it was really weird. And then she kissed me, and I was like, oh my God, what? This is like, slight so wet and. Ah, oh, do I like it? Am I doing it right? Uh, uh. I thought what you do is you held your breath for as long as possible and 
rammed your face into someone else's. Mm. And that's what I did until I was... It was like that. <laughs> We Brits have always been less experienced than our European peers. The term French kiss was coined by British Tommies who'd copped off with local girls during World War I. And even today, we think of those French as a bit exotic. My first kiss was with... Um, on a French exchange. And it was with a French boy. And I, I didn't want to do this tongue thing. And I remember saying, pas avec le... pas avec... Pas avec. <laughs> and I remember coming away from that feeling, and I remember these words going through my head. You're a woman now. You're a woman. Because you've kissed Boris in the woods, sans le. Space out the way, next on the agenda for British teens is losing their virginity. Danes, Finns and Icelanders typically have sex for the first time aged 16, whereas British cherries don't tend to pop until we're 17 years old. But we do take a lot of mock exams beforehand. I think my first wank was over Madonna. I was a big fan of Madonna. So it wasn't the girls in school, but I think my first pedal, as you call it, in uh, Iceland was over Madonna. Yeah. Mid 80s, when she was fit, not now. I didn't wank over her now, she looks fucked. That's a shame, Danny. Uh, she likes a bit of rough. Now, for your final test, it's important you pack a rubber in your pencil case. 80% of us sensible Brits use a condom for our first sexual experience, compared with just half of young Italians. I went to a party once, and it was before I had uh, any idea of what you do with girls or anything like that. And But I'd heard that you have to take a Johnny bag just in case. And my dad dropped me off, and it, as I got out of the car, it fell onto the floor, and he said, I think you've forgotten something. And I said, I don't know what that is or where it came from or anything. <laughs> Shut the door and went off. I haven't seen I don't even know who you are. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Goodbye. So, with all the preparations complete, it's the small matter of finding someone to do it with. And it seems we're not picky. Only one in seven young British men say they were in love with the person they lost their virginity to, compared with half of all young Dutch men. I don't know if you remember when Peter Crouch scored his first goal for Liverpool. Yeah. It's, and it, was a mass, it wasn't a good goal, it was a massive deflection, but it's just getting off the mark, really. Yeah, isn't it? it is. There's a lot of bragging. There's a lot of people who claim they lost their virginity on holiday to a French person that you'll never meet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Last Friday, I think it was. It was a long time after school days. Long time. Oh, it was a long, bleak period. In fact, I remember, I do remember owning some condoms that I had to throw away because they went past their sell by date. That's how exciting my sex life was as a teenager. There was two girls in my maths class having a competition to lose their virginity first, right? They sat either side of me and they didn't lose it to me. How do you think that made me feel? Imagine that, being in the middle of a competition. I was like, no, didn't want to know. Degraded, isn't it? Two-thirds of Dutch parents let their 16-year-olds have boyfriends and girlfriends to stay in their rooms. British teens aren't so lucky, especially when it comes to their first time. It was on the beach, because that's the only place we could go, on, on, on the, in Broadstairs at night, I thought, um, that's going to go pretty well. I do remember that she got up there and then ran, because it was summer, and she ran into the sea. And I thought, oh, my God, she's gone to commit suicide. <laughs> was it that bad? But then she came back and she said, yeah, it's, uh, no, it was fine. Ah, oh, losing my Virginia was absolutely horrendous, because it, it, it happened in the back of her fiesta. And she weren't a small girl. And it was, the fiesta weren't, weren't exactly like... A, it's not a roomy car. It's not a cash car, for example. And she drove me home afterwards. I'll never forget, um, uh, Black Street, No Diggity, was the first song I heard after losing my V-plates. <laughs> and I remember just, like, sat there, and I was quite, like, shaken by the whole thing. And then that came on, and I was just like... And I was, I was so chuffed with myself. And my dad, I remember walking in, my dad going, where have you been? And I was just like, nowhere. 
Figured he'd just turn around and go, oh, lost your V-plates, every boy. I can see you've got a glow about you. He just went, stop being weird. And that was it. <laughs> So what lessons did we learn today? Well, we turn up at the school gates as a fresh-faced and innocent five-year-old and leave a decade later as a jaded, anxious, awkward teenager, riddled with very British problems. In Britain, school teaches you everything about how to behave and how to, how to be. I'm deeply worried when anyone tells me they're homeschooled. They have never had their face pushed down a toilet <laughs> for wearing the wrong trainers. Because we don't just learn our times tables in capital cities, we also pick up those unspoken rules of behaviour that we'll carry with us for the rest of our lives, long after we've forgotten the capital of Namibia. I want to say Maputo. Oh, no, hang on. That's Mozambique. You don't forget, we're all pretending like we're adults. We're all pretending like we're adults, like we've moved on in our lives. We can all remember who fingered who and how many times you got fingered.